Welcome. Welcome to Divine Renovation, to our From the Trenches uh, online event, which actually uh, we're just starting a new year. We, we took off a, a couple of months. Um, and so we're just really glad to have you all back together, a community of leaders. Um, we see already many uh, old friends and, and new. So we encourage you to uh, put in the, the, the chat there where you're, where you're joining us from. Uh, my name is Kirk Clement. I am the Executive Director of Divine Renovation USA. Um, Divine Renovation, if you're not familiar, is a, a global ministry focused on the renewal of Catholic parishes, or like the subtitle of the book that started the this ministry and this movement uh, is Bring Your Parish from Maintenance to Mission. So our, we help parishes on that journey to become missional, to be outposts for the Great Commission, not to just maintain a, and serve Catholics in an area, but helping parishes really develop a missionary posture or orientation so that parishes can be about bringing people to Jesus. And that's that's what, what we're all about. And so this uh, online event every month, we, we try to gather together uh, leaders to hear and learn from one another. And to feature stories from the trenches, real life practitioners. We don't want to just propose theories of renewal and leadership, but we really want to stay uh, rooted at the ground level of what's happening. What are we learning on this journey? I'm excited that over the next, uh, till the end of the year, we're going to be framing up our from the trenches through the lens of a pyramid that we often use within divine renovation. It's a kind of a coaching pyramid, but it's, it outlines the seven key dimensions of parish renewal. And we've just found this as a helpful framework as we've learned what happens in the process. A lot of people see the fruit at the top and they're like, we want that fruit. And we see a parish that's making disciples, doing great things, and they want to, they want that for their parish. And so they oftentimes start to uh, adopt the tools and the processes, the programs, the strategies, those things which are above the proverbial waterline, those things you can see. And you might start to get some momentum. You know, some of those strategies and programs can, can, can work and produce some fruit. But we often see that because culture is such a powerful force that oftentimes they'll fizzle out, they'll kind of get pushed back from the dominant culture of the parish. And so there's this really important work that ends up being a lot of the focus of our work, which is these elements under the waterline, really about changing the culture of the parish so that strategies and, and programs can be sustainable over time and produce fruit. And so what we're going to do over the next few months is just unpack some new content attached to each of these dimensions. So today, vision is around, yeah, vision, because vision for us is at the foundation of leading change, of leading renewal. So we're going to talk about that. Um, and then over the next, we'll, we'll share with you more about what we're doing next month around leadership. So we're just trying to um, yeah, next month is Why Churches on Mission Love Leadership Summits. So that's just some of where we're headed. But just to step back um, today, um, we are focused on this topic of vision. Um, and I want to bring up um, my friend Eric, who is the Executive Director of Divine Renovation in Canada. And uh, so welcome, uh, Eric. Eh? How you doing hey, today? <laughs> Yeah, hey everybody, good to be with you. I'm uh, really excited about this this topic um, from could be to to should be five ways you can fuel your conviction in in parish renewal. Because like you said, Kurt, um, we can kind of be in the kind of dream realm of oh wishful thinking around what could be, but it's not until we've seen that we have a deep conviction for change. It's not driven by by guilt. Sometimes the word should could be associated with like a a guilt thing. Mm. But it's more, uh, uh, it's just not right. You know, it's just not right that um, that my parish is is kind of perhaps in more towards maintenance mode when the world needs us more now more than ever. So 
So that should isn't a guilt fueled should. It's a, a deep conviction, mm. uh, a hope and a dream of what what might be, what should be, and the energy and and uh, resources necessary to move it ahead. So, so yeah, that's mm. what we're gonna get un unpack a bit more today. So awesome. I'm really excited about that. Awesome. Well, and if you connected divine with divine renovation before, you know that we talk about the importance of vision, and, and we define vision as a God-given picture of the future that produces passion in people. And, and, and so I think we've done, we, we do that in different ways within divine renovation, help people to, you know, they say, I want more for my parish, um, or we want to go under a process of renewal, but what is that more? You know, you're going to make these changes, but but where are you headed? You know, how do you communicate that to parishioners so they know why you're making the changes that you're making? And so, you know, we talk about having a vision and developing a vision, but then there's a whole nother part of having a vision, which is how do you communicate it effectively to your parishioners and to the people that you're leading? Um, and so I think that's going to be a big focus of our topic today. It's not, it's having a vision, the importance of vision, but also communicating a vision. So I want to start off with a quick poll here. We're going to put up on the screen a poll to see kind of where people are coming for on this topic. And so you'll see the first, uh, it's a vision assessment poll. Where is your parish at with vision? First is our parish just doesn't have a vision. Or two is our parish has a vision, but it's not communicated in a clear, consistent, and compelling way. Or third, our parish has a vision, and it's communicated in a clear, consistent, and compelling way. So this is great feedback. So about a third of those joining you don't yet have a vision, um, which we'll talk a little bit about that. Um, and then the bulk, um, the, the largest majority have a vision, but could use help in how to communicate it effectively. And then uh, a little under a third have a vision and it's communicated in a clear and consistent way. So that's, that's awesome. And hopefully even for those, you'll hear some things that will really uh, help you even more because communicating vision is uh, an art, you know, that we have to continue to refine and get better at. So that's, that's great, uh, great feedback there. So, Eric, I'm really excited about our guest and our content today. I mean, I first heard this and uh, and I've actually incorporated it into my coaching. I gave a talk in the Diocese of Dallas last week and used a lot of the content that I, I've learned from our guest today. So I know you're friends and, uh, with our guest. Uh, so could, could you uh, introduce uh, our guest presenter today? Yeah, for sure. Uh, I'm just really pleased uh, to introduce Eric Chow. Uh, we've been friends for a long time. Eric's been involved in ministry and leadership and uh, supporting missionary disciples in their apostolates for uh, almost 20 years um, or over 20 years, around 20 years. You started when you were nine years old, Eric, I guess. That's is right. That, yeah. Six. Um, <laughs> yes. So uh, Eric is the director of Proclaim. It's a movement of the Diocese of uh, the Archdiocese of Vancouver. And uh, he's been at that for almost four years now here. And uh, Eric has a lot of experience to share in and through coaching, as I said, leaders in ministry, uh, parishes, and uh, and teams. We worked together for uh, almost 15 years in an apostolate called Catholic Christian Outreach, which I know some of you on the call here are familiar with. Um, we were in cahoots in that ministry for a long time, learned so much together and uh, leading together. And uh, Eric's a great communicator and, and a coach and a leader, so we're so blessed to have you here with us today, Eric. Let's uh, let's pray, and then we'll hop into today's topic. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Father, we honor and bless you. We thank you for your goodness to us. Your goodness, most especially, uh, made known to us through your Son, Jesus. And Jesus, we welcome you. We welcome you here. We gather in your name. We pray that you might send your Holy Spirit to be with each of us, open our minds and our hearts to all that you have for us today, Holy Spirit. Make us attentive to your voice, 
and Lord bless uh, Eric and uh, Father Matthew as they share with us today. Speak to us, Holy Spirit, and uh, give us your power so we can help more and more people come to know and love your son, Jesus, and enter more fully into the life of his church. Lead us and guide us today, we pray, through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Amen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. So, Eric, I'm going to kick it over to you to uh, say a little bit about proclaiming the, the work that you're doing briefly, and then um, launch into our uh, five ways. Thank you. Feel <clears throat> conviction and parish renewal. <clears throat> thanks, Eric, and thanks, Kirk, for uh, providing this opportunity. I'm so grateful to have this opportunity to share a few things. Uh, just a little bit about the Proclaim movement here in our Archdiocese of Vancouver. It launched in October 2019 in response to Pope Francis' invitation to the whole world, to the whole Catholic world, to observe an extraordinary month of mission. Uh, our Archdiocese took that as a prompting and a call to launch this movement, which has as its mission to awaken disciples to proclaim Jesus, to respond to the call to discipleship, follow me, and I will make you fishers of men. Now, the reason why I think Proclaim has uh, something to do with our workshop today is that Proclaim really started out of a vision for the prefer a preferred picture of a future that Pope Francis offered in Evangelii Gaudium. I'm going to put a little quote on the screen, and this is really at the heart of the Proclaim movement. In it, he says, Pope Francis says, I dream of a missionary option that is a missionary impulse capable of transforming everything so that the church's customs, ways of doing things, times and schedules, language and structures can be suitably channeled for the evangelization of today's world rather than for her self-preservation. What, what an incredible statement from our Holy Father. And really, it's, it's a vision that he provided, an I dream statement that helped us see a preferred picture for the future. And this is where Proclaim finds its drive and its, uh, and its beginnings in this statement. Now, vision is one of those things that you might be familiar with. Uh, you might have a statement in your parish. Some of you have mentioned that you've got some plans in place. But vision can be a little bit nebulous when it comes to communicating it and bringing it forward into the life of the parish. And how does vision begin to affect change? How does it affect change within the life of your parish? And I want to provide a couple of statements that's going to help uh, pro uh, provide a, a platform for how we're going to communicate vision and how, uh, how our five ways can move vision from uh, a clear sort of this idea into uh, real tangible action. I want to move to a definition from Andy Stanley, a pastor in the United States, where he gave this very simple definition for vision. Vision is a clear mental picture of what could be fueled by the conviction that it should be. I want to read it again because there's a lot to unpack here. A clear mental picture of what could be fueled by the conviction that it should be. Now, if you were to take a vision and to provide the vision that you have for your parish, if you have one, and start to communicate that to your ministry leaders, I would venture to say that most of these individuals would agree with the clear picture that you would provide. In fact, they would say that it's possible that what you're sharing, it could be a good thing. Uh, however, there can be a gap between could be and should be, in that when we communicate a statement, a clear picture, the question is, are those we're communicating to fueled by a conviction that it should be? Do they lie awake at night thinking about what could be in their parish? Are they fueled by this conviction and driven by this conviction to change the way they act, to give of their time and their talent and their treasure to helping accomplish this vision? And that's the challenge that we find ourselves in today. So I'm going to offer five doable ways that you can fuel conviction in parish renewal. So these are these are tangible ways in which we can break down this complex idea of vision into things that we can take on. So the first thing that I want to start with is that each of these five doable ways is rooted in this statement, to inspire a shared vision. Each of these words means something, we're going to break it down, to inspire, to share, 
and then to bring people into this vision. So our first way of fueling conviction uh, comes from a bit of a, an engineering background. So I, I'm an engineer by trade. Uh, I left that profession a long time ago from building bridges to building the kingdom. And I want to start with this equation. Vision is equal to A to B. So our first statement or our first way here is to see the vision as getting from point A to B, to getting from point A to B. So our vision is not just a statement, but it's this A to B understanding. So A is equal to the current state of your parish. How would you describe your parish today? What is the current state of its people, its faithfulness, its activities, the structure, the leadership development, the leadership structure that you have? It's, it's describing all of this. B is equal to that future state, that preferred picture of a future. So now, once we have this equation in mind, I want to ask you a few questions. What do you see wrong with A? And why can't we stay in A? Now, why is B better than A? So we're, we're, we're contrasting two pictures of, of what we could see in our, in our parish. One is the current reality and the other is a future state. And we're, tr we're, we're aiming to try to answer these questions. What's wrong with A? Why can't we stay here? And why is B better? The last thing we wanna answer is how does B solve what's wrong with A? Now our mission now, once we understand our vision in this way is to help us get from point A to point B, to get from point A to point B. Now, I'm going to run through these five ways really quickly. We're going to have some pauses to unpack some of this. I usually run this through workshops that can last anywhere from half mm. a day to a couple of days. So I uh, just want to keep that in mind so that the next 20 minutes are going to be calorie dense. We're just going to throw it out and, uh, and let you sit with it. And hopefully there's something that you're going to take away from it. Okay. So the second way that we can move, uh, that we can feel conviction is to communicate why we can't stay here. Now, when we communicate vision and a preferred picture for a future, uh, sometimes our recipients, our listeners could be thinking, well, what's in it for me? And why should I move from this current state? Because whether real or perceived, a lot of people can feel comfortable with A, with where we are. Uh, they're unwilling to change. They're unwilling to put in the time and the effort and the work to moving from A to B. Part of what we need to do when we communicate why we can't stay here is to help see that the pain of moving to B, the work that it requires to convict and to fuel this conviction of parish renewal and a preferred picture of the future, the pain of that is less than the pain of staying where we are. So the pain of moving from B is less than the pain of staying in A. I wanna provide a possible or a propose a way in which we can communicate why we can't stay here through a series of steps. The first is to select a topic that concerns you about A, about the current reality. And the way you can do that would be to state an imagine sentence or to uh, ask a question. Here's a couple of examples. Imagine in 10 years what our churches will look like if the, the decline in mass attendance continues in its, in its downward trend. Or a question could be, what might our world look like if the opioid crisis continues to grow as it does? So now you've provoked something of what we see in our current reality. Then from there, we wanna be able to con convince the mind with data and facts to help them see that factually speaking, we see something happening in our world today. And here is the data that we need for our minds to be convinced of what we're seeing. In addition to that, for us to help people see why they can't stay there is, is to move the heart with the story. Uh, stories are what move us and convict us internally. When we can provide a case for this point from moving from A to B through data and through stories, now we've started to kind of sort of stir within someone the, that conviction that, yeah, you know what, you're right, I, we can't stay here. Well, what's the better option? This is the moment when we can now pre present our preferred picture for the future. And finally, the last thing that we can do in communicating why we can't stay here is to ask people to invite people to action 
to pray for this preferred picture, to get involved in some way, to respond to an invitation that you have, to be engaged in the life of the parish that is moving uh, towards mission. So here are two ways that we can fuel this conviction. I'm going to pause and and put it back to our, our group here just to see if there's anything that's mm. standing out so far. Yeah, I love no. this, Eric, because because I love how um those two things work together. It strikes me that if we just talk about A, like like a tendency maybe for me to be a complainer, like, oh, why we can't stay here? What's wrong with here? You know, like that, that that's just talking about A is relegated to the area of complaining. And then and then sometimes we try to set a direction for the future, as, as you had rightly said in number two. Um, and we talk about B. But like you said, the the comfort of A, the familiarity with A, and it's not malicious. It's just like um, we're just hesitant to change sometimes, especially right. into, into the unknown. So we can talk about B uh, a lot. But if you don't kind of like if I don't remove the platform from underneath me of A, then my tendency and my default, the path of least resistance is to just hang out in A. Exactly. Mm -hmm. Yeah. 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 I love well, this topic, I think, is so important just because I, I know when I was in a parish and we had a vision, we went to a divine mission conference and we were like, we have a vision, make disciples, go and bring people to Jesus. And we would get up and be like, all excited. Woo and then it'd be like, everybody's like, oh, you know, people weren't that moved by it, you know, and there was this like disconnect from, I mean, we, we say a vision is meant to inspire passion in people, beginning with us, like I got to be passionate about it, it's got to get me out of bed. Okay, yeah. but it's actually got to, it's meant to inspire passion in the other people too. <laughs> so yeah. if you share your vision and everybody else is left going, hmm, that doesn't sound that new or interesting or inspiring, then it's like vision's not doing the job it's supposed to do in a sense, right? Yeah. And I love those three things you mentioned. One is the head, you know, like, did you, you know, a statistic. Um, the the story and the call to action those i mean i know we, we don't have so much time on this but each one of those i've just seen well it, it's specifically the call to action it reminds me of the old saying a vision without a strategy is a hallucination and i think a lot of times visions mean they, they're these abstract hallucinations but they don't mean anything versus if you say a vision, you're like, so our two priorities in the coming year are blank and blank. And what I need from you is to blank and blank. Then vision is experienced as a completely different thing. So I think that connection to vision and the call to action is such an important point. Yeah. Painting a picture for that preferred future requires a change, not only in a community, but in individuals. And when we can make that easy for individuals, I'm going to give you a next step that's doable for you. Then we can start to see progress. If things are resonating for everyone here too, please feel free mm -hmm. to engage in the chat or what what's sticking out for you for, for your own um, capturing of, of the point, but also for the, um, for the group as well to capture it too. So Eric, why don't you, uh, continue on and unpack the next uh, next way to feel conviction. Absolutely. Yeah, we're going to go to way number three. And, and this is really about that word shared in the statement I mentioned, inspire a shared vision. We have to help people see themselves in the future. I'm going to take a moment right now and I'm going to, I'm going to read from Acts chapter two, verses 42 to 47. And it describes the first Christian community. This is the description of a, well, quote unquote, coming out of the speech of St. Peter. So I'm going to put it on screen. I'm going to read it. They devote themselves Oh, oh my gosh. We lost them. <laughs> we lost them. We lost them, everybody. Well, hopefully Eric can re rejoin us uh, in a second here, but but maybe yeah. we can just take, take a moment and try to try to think about a situation where you're making an effort to go from A to B, like, oh, there's a screen now. We're back. Hey, there there is. Is. we just, we got bumped, but <clears throat> I was just about to read from Acts chapter two. So this is the first, first community. They devoted themselves to the apostles teaching and fellowship to the breaking of the bread and the prayers. All came upon everyone because many wonders and signs were being done by the apostles. All who believed were together and had all things in common. 
they would sell their possessions and goods and distribute the proceeds to all as any had need. Day by day, as they spent much time together in the temple, they broke bread at home and ate their food with glad and generous hearts, praising God and having the goodwill of all the people. And day by day, the Lord added to their number those who were being saved. I love this description of a first Christian community because it, it speaks to a preferred picture of a future that I think a lot of us would love to see in the life of our parishes. But under this way of helping people see themselves in a preferred future, we have to first try to understand where are people coming from when they hear a description of this per first uh, of this picture of a preferred future. So when you look at that line, they devoted themselves to the teaching of the apostles. That to me sounds exciting, but to perhaps some of your uh, parishioners, it could sound like teaching and catechesis as my at my parish is boring. I don't want any more of de any more devotion to the teaching. Or all who believed were together and all, had all things in common. You know, people could think, I don't want to share. Or day by day, they spent much time together in the temple and they broke bread at home and ate their food with glad and generous hearts. Could sound like to someone, that sounds like a lot more work. I already spend all my time at the church. None of this sounds attractive. So for us, we have to understand that when we're painting a picture of a preferred future, we also have to help invite people see themselves in that future. Where are they sitting, standing? What is their experience of this new future? Uh, how, how can we help them see it in a positive uh, and, and joyful and grace-filled light? One way we can do that is to do an exercise that I like to call I see, you see. It's a basic exercise that helps people describe a clear, vivid, and attractive preferred picture of the future. And it's simple. It's answering the question, when I reflect on our vision statement, whatever it is, what I see statements come to mind. So it could be anything. It could be, I see families engaging uh, in the parking lot with their kids after mass, or I see um, beautiful singing uh, in the liturgy, or I see new people coming to our parish regularly and engaging with our community. So I see statements help us listen and understand how others see themselves in, the, uh, in this, in, in our vision. And when we hear what they have to say, then we can better engage them and invite them to be part of that preferred picture of the future. So mm. I'm going to move to way number four, uh, aim to inspire more than to motivate. And I love this one because inspiration uh, has, could look like a synonym to motivation, but if we look at the root meanings of these two words, they're actually quite different. In fact, motivation is, is meant to move or stimulate towards an action, but it's an external source where an external source is moving someone. It's energy from outside that moves us towards an action. Whereas the root word of inspiration is to breathe into, to move our spirit to come from in in uh, in in the in the Christian sense a supernatural source that the inspiration of the Holy Spirit would move into our hearts that would uh, that would lead us to action. So, what does motivation of a vision look like? Well, it's focused on external behaviors. It's focused on like the top of the pyramid type stuff. It's like we just need to get more people to mass. We just need to uh, to to adopt various different programs. Whereas inspiration to inspire a vision looks more like internal conversion. For us as leaders, we're taking the time to reflect and ask for the Holy Spirit to move us, to change our heart, to change our mind, and then to invite others to do the same. So aim to inspire more than to motivate. So I'm going to pause here again. Eric and Kurt, anything that's standing out for you? Hmm. Well, the, the only thing I, do, I want to go back to is your slide about I see, you see. Give me like a practical, so that would that be if, let's just say a pastor or a, a team, there's a vision and they were wanting to get buy into the vision. Is that meant to be a process by we would say, you would say, hey, you're, it's the shared vision part of it, right? So you're getting people to buy into it and you're, yes. you're sharing, but you're also inviting their feedback to see how it resonates with them and you're listening. And then do you then modify the vision based off that or you modify it and you learn how to communicate it to connect with people? So is that... Is that a, a step that's meant to help buy into the vision? Is that 
Yeah, that's a great question, Kurt. I, I've used this IC statement in both places where if a parish has is not does not have clarity with their vision, then they're using it as an exercise to pull out what their leaders see as a preferred picture of the future. So that's that's one way that you can use it. Now, for a parish that has uh, is on their way to accomplishing and moving their vision, they've spent the time to pray and to be inspired by the Holy Spirit to have a vision for the parish. This is a way to invite others into seeing themselves in their vision. So uh, as I had mentioned, in I think in this slide, let me see if I can pull it back up. Um, so in this slide, it says like, you know, when I reflect on our vision statement, what I see statements come to mind, it's taking the time to, to almost like get steeped in what we've communicated as our vision. And now where do you see yourself in that? So in my home parish, we have a mission and a vision um, that's centered around calling and forming missionary disciples. So my question to our leaders would be, well, well what do you see? And some of them will say things like, well, I, I see a lot of welcoming happening outside of our uh, out of, outside of our churches and, and others say, well, I see some of us going out into the neighborhoods and, and walking and inviting those within our community. So part of what we want to do here is to invite people to step into the vision that we see. And, and that once we're able mm -hmm. to start to imagine ourselves in that vision, then it becomes a lot more tangible for us to say, you know what, this is possible. And I actually want this. That's, that's probably the last, like that's, mm -hmm. I, I want what I'm seeing. Uh, because I, I'm now stepping into it. I'm, I'm feeling it. I'm experiencing it in my imagination. I'm sharing it with others. And, um, and now we're getting a more deeper understanding of what our parish vision could be. I, I love so the coming up with the vision. Too. Oh, good. I was going to say, I love the distinction you're making too, Eric, because um, yeah, you're not relying just on the vision statement to communicate the full breadth and depth of what we see in the future. So that's where in Divine Renovation, we make that distinction too between the vision statement and the exercise of regularly casting vision, it's its more of a muscle to be worked than a statement to be landed on. So this is like mm -hmm. a drill we can use to be trained in how to cast, cast vision on the regular, like in our and leaders here in your small groups or in the ministries that you lead or are part of, like, I see this in the future is a compelling and, and powerful motivator to yeah. towards that picture. So uh, Eric, why don't you, you give us the last, uh, the fifth way. And then we're going to have Father Matt share a little bit about uh, your reflections, Father Matt, on, on uh, your experience of casting vision in the parish. Absolutely. So the fifth way is to become a broken record about your parish vision. So for many of you who have been part of wrestling with praying for and seeking vision for your parish. This has been a, a process that, that, that has taken hours of meetings, days, weeks of, of thinking through things. And um, I think what ends up happening is that because we have spent so much time thinking about it and now wanting to communicate it, we end up under communicating with the rest of our parish community, um, the vision that we've spent so much time um, working on. In fact, here's a, a litmus test. I think that each of you as leaders or as part of SLTs should start to get sick of speaking about your vision, not because you're no longer convicted of it, because you're talking about it so much. And if you're at that place, then I would venture to say that those who are listening to it are just starting to, to have it like well up within themselves, that their conviction is just at the front end of where you'd like them to be. So this is where I would suggest taking time to reflect on your vision in your weekly meetings, to speak about parts of your vision in different ministries and in formation. And really what you're looking for is, is listening for other people speaking about your vision or language that you've centered around your vision with conviction. Because once you hear them speaking about it, then you know it's starting to stick. So you want to move towards having parts of your vision become part of the everyday parish language. So this is a, again, another doable thing. It's, it's integrating vision communication into everything that you're a part of meetings, ministries, groups, don't just use uh, a leadership summit or a, or a, or a ministry fair to communicate vision once mm. or twice in the year, and then wait to do it again next year. This should be something that is regularly brought into the fabric of the of everyday living in the life of your parish. So there you have it. Those are the five mm. ways uh, to break down vision as getting from A to B. Number one, number two, communicating why we can't stay here. 
Number three, helps people see themselves in the vision. Number four, aim to inspire more than to motivate. And number five, become a broken record about your parish vision. Mm, great stuff. Great stuff, Eric. Um, I definitely have a few questions and a couple of them are piggybacking off of questions I've seen in the chat. So I want to come back to you, but want to also take a minute and pause and want to bring on our guest uh, pastor here, Father Matthew Lamoureux who has been on this journey of renewal, having a vision for mission um, for many years now. And so if we could um, spotlight and bring on Father Father Matthew. So Father Matthew, good to have you here. Welcome. And if you could just share everybody just where you're from, your parish, just quick introduction. Sure. Thanks for having me. And uh, yeah, so uh, I belong to the Marians of the Immaculate Conception. So we are most known for our Divine Mercy Shrine in Stockbridge, Massachusetts. So I was an expert in divine mercy. I could talk about that, but when I became a pastor, yeah, not so much. And so just like leaving a parish and doing all these things was not, uh, yeah, it was it was new for me. And uh, so I'm, I'm pastor of St. Patrick Parish, which is in Yorkville, Illinois, the Julia Diocese, west of Chicago. I'm a pastor now for over 13 years. It was longer than normal, mm -hmm. but since I'm a religious order, I can kind of... Uh, be on the radar a little bit and stick around a little bit longer. Uh -huh. um, but I would say the first four years, uh, you know, I was I was new at it. Um, I felt like I was a gerbil on a gerbil wheel after four years. I, I wasn't seeing the fruit. I I wasn't really sure how to run meetings well or to or to talk about vision. You know, we had a uh, um, a mission statement like most parishes have, like when you get the bulletin, you have the mission statement on the bottom and stuff like that. And so, which was made by a parish council back in 1920, probably. And uh, so, yeah. so, so everybody still has that. And, uh, um, and I remember we tried to come up with a new one and, uh, and, and we spent like two hours in a meeting with the parish council and it was pure pain, you know, because we we're all, we we're just trying to get, consensus on all these different words and phrases and at least i got about 500 years of a purgatory i think just by those <laughs> meetings but that was good but and, and then when we came up with it um and people <laughs> would ask us about you know I, I think it was purpose and mission so they would uh, say okay so what's your purpose and mission and i would forget or i would just like remember like a couple parts and i was thinking hmm if the pastor doesn't know how to um Mm. Uh, you know, can we call this? How can we, how can we expect the uh, people of the parish to remember? So, I was convicted, and uh, and then I, you know, became open to being coached. Uh, you know, first through amazing parish table group, they helped us, uh, and then, um, but then it was through divine renovation back in 2016 with the first conference, and uh, and then we got live coaching, which is key, and uh, yeah, so. And, and it just started from there. So then we we figured, and it's not me. We need to me, Kurt. But we, we we figured that you know we need a a uh, concise mission, a concise vision. Um, and actually, we got we got rid of our. I mean, we still have our, our mission, but we said let's just come up with one statement. A, an argument can be made with having a purpose and a vision and a mission and so forth, but one statement. Mm. So. We came up with eventually in prayer and, and with a newly revamped parish council um, and a help of a coach as well. And with our senior leadership team, we eventually came up with a transform lives by making church matter, building disciples and seeking and saving the lost. Mm. That's it. And uh, simple. I mean, we saw it from other churches too, like parts of it, but like put that all together and, uh, um, you know, make it simple so we can remember it so that people can mm -hmm. and then um you know what we did well i would say was um first of all, well i'll say what we did well then we'll, i'll get to the bad uh, we did. well how did you real quick as you you landed on i mean there's the you vision you did some visioneering you landed on a concise how did you begin to roll it out and and what was that like i would say you know we were excited uh, as Eric was saying, like, um, yeah, you get excited about it and like, yeah, this is the best vision ever. And uh, and then you say to the parish and it's like, OK, all right. So what's that? What's that look like? So 
the key thing is I included my homilies, especially at the beginning, uh, a message series, and and we tried to to put stories around it. We tried our best. Maybe we came out too quick, um, uh, too fast, and so yeah. So that was that was a good and the bad. We uh, uh we were clear, you know, on, on the parish level and all the masses, but then we struggled a little bit uh, to get it to everybody. So that was some trial and error. And uh, but I would say by in in time in time we we had it uh we, we were very intentional about the about the staff about the key leaders. Then we started like leadership summits, and we were we were we had that SLT student student leadership team. We had had them break out to different parts of the vision statement, and so they can see it wasn't just from Father Matt, but this is from uh, the SLT from the staff as well. Uh, so that was. That was the that was key at the beginning. The good the great part was we had a clear vision and then we were able to make difficult decisions for the parish that we would not have made before. Because like the vision allowed mm. us to have like clarity, like it was like we put on like new glasses and, and, wow. and we could see things differently and and that that was huge. That was huge for us. Yeah. Right. Cause one of the definitions of a, a vision is like it's the it's the it's the North Star. In a certain sense, you're like that became an orientation. You're not just strategically planning and thinking what to do with like, hey, what should we do? You're saying, what should we do that's going to get us to there? And that that was that experience in our parish is we once we did have a vision, it gave us a filter, um, which is what you're saying. That's that's a great, great example of how the power of having a vision. And then it helped us to transform the culture, which took time, which is still taking time. You know, even though we've been at this for at least 2014, I would say, and then 2016 DR, um, I would say we've changed about 70% of the culture of the parish, maybe maybe 80%. But there's still going to be those who, <laughs> you know, not going to convince them. But that's right. Don't allow that. Talking to any pastors there, don't allow that to stop you. Have a good leadership team around you to, to give it that courage, but have clear, mm. clear vision. Um, it helped us as well with our with the diocese because before my my opinion was okay, just stay off the radar of the diocese because I'm a religious order priest for the westernmost part, so it's just stay off the radar. And uh, so the Lord uh, convicted us that you know we it's not just for us, this is for other parishes in the area and for the diocese, and so. Um, we went a little bit too quick at the beginning for the diocese. <laughs> we had some struggles there. Then once we uh, uh, helped that communication, um, that's that's really ballooned there and been a great fruit. So in fact, now I'm involved in the diocese, Juliet, helping this, uh, helping other parishes to come on board for uh, for clear vision and and in terms of a uh, maintenance to mission and, and 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 in fact helping other parishes, other dioceses across the country too sometimes. So. It's been a change, mm. but uh, but I would say that a lot of it has come from a clear, clear vision. Mm. That's great. So you've because um, a lot of right now we're talking about this, the communication of vision. So you, you guys developed a vision, which say what your vision is again. Somebody asked that about what was your vision? It transformed lives. It's understood. In oh, somebody put it there, actually. Yeah. Oh, Susan yeah. put it there, actually. It's in the chat. I'll transform lives by making church matter, building disciples and seeking and saving the lost. So that's great. So right now it's a lot about kind of how we're commu how to communicate that well. And you mentioned things like leadership summits. You probably had homilies. I mean, you've been at this a long time. Um, have you been able to just do you still preach and, and share the vision? Like they talk about people getting sick of hearing it or you getting sick of hearing yourself talk about it. Have you experienced? experienced some of that or has there been a temptation to forget about the vision and just kind of assume everybody knows the vision yes all that all, all that. that all right in, good you know <laughs> in, in in different stages that like at times uh we feel like we're totally on it like this is great we're speaking about this and, and then i forget and and so so my staff my leadership team needs to remind me okay father we haven't talked about this in a little while and sometimes you feel guilty or feel bad about like, am I just a broken record? Are people mm. being inspired by this? And so that's why you really need to pray into it, have have ways to make it alive, you know, stories and you know, inspire mm. people. Um, so I think it's been both. It's like there's seasons. There's seasons of, you know, we're, we're, we're doing it great. And then other times in which 
Uh, yeah, I, we totally for, forgot about this. And, yeah, but, yeah. but keep on holding you accountable. Uh, don't give up. Keep on being persistent, you know, with that. Yeah, no, it's so good. It's so good to hear this, the real life stories of, because uh, you've been doing it. You've been really working at Renewal for a long time. So uh, maybe just to bring Eric and the Eric's back on the call as we, you know, land this in the next, uh, you know, few minutes. Um, and if there's any burning questions, um, I think, there's one question about how to get a pastor to, um, you know, how do you get your pastor to see this is important? Um, you know, it seems, Eric, and if you have any ideas on that, follow Matt as well. But Eric, there's a lot of people in the church who are very skeptical about vision, mission, all of that work, right? Because I think they've seen really bad examples of vision um i think there's some that also would say well jesus gave us the mission like let's not waste our time with all of that let's just get to work jesus gave us yeah what would you say to that objection you know of jesus gave us the mission statement and uh that's all a, a hogwash or a waste of time yeah i think th uh when when receiving that statement jesus gave us the mission Absolutely, 100% agree with that. And at the same time, the church has given each and every one of our parishes and our diocese a specific geographic area that we've been entrusted to. So, so the parish isn't just about the people who have been registered at our parish. It's, it's the geographic area. And that geographic area has people that are engaged with us as a parish and who are not. And we should be concerned about them in the same way. Uh, that geographic area has certain contexts, nuances, um, ways of life, interests, uh, you know, all, all these things play into understanding that people, which means then the better we are clear, the more clear we are with our vision, the better we can serve those people. So the statement to go and make disciples of all nations matters. Now it's a matter of understanding, well, who's in the nation? Who's who's in our geographic area that we've been entrusted to take care of? So I think mm. a vision gives clarity to that. Mm. Yeah. And uh, somebody asked, that was great. Thank you, Eric. Somebody asked, how did the vision help with other decisions in the parish? And Susan in the chat is Father Matthew's business uh, manager or director of operations. And she said, the vision has helped to dictate how we use our resources, our time, our people, our money, and our space, right? So when you, when you start to budget and for the next year, it's always in light of your vision and your strategy. So, right. I mean, Father Matthew, anything to add to that? Like it's changed a, a lot of decisions, right? Yeah. It's, it's uh, huge decisions here, including, um, uh, you know, our school, you know, school 10 minutes away and how to still support that. But, in the right way, subsidizing the right way. And that was difficult, but but it, it, it really brought clarity to that decision. Yeah. I, I think of too, Kurt, uh, from the original Divine Renovation book that Father Mallon wrote uh, from Maintenance to Mission. He speaks about, um, uh, in part of the book, the use of the space at the parish. And he had this vision for a missionary, disciple-making, um, uh, conversion-happening parish. Um, and he wanted to implement a, an evangelization tool in his context was alpha. And uh, there, there was uh, different programs happening in all the different spaces. And it was, it's the opening chapter of the book called house of cards, because there was, there was cards There happened to be cards, not that there's anything wrong with cards. Um, but uh, Father James wanted to prioritize evangelization in the parish. And he got big time uh, pushback. They had to work through and help cast a vision. This, this is what we hope to be. Alpha is going to help us make mm. disciples, reach people for Jesus, help people encounter the Holy Spirit in a in a new or way or for the first time. And so it helped him um, prioritize the use of, as Susan said there, space mm. in light of the vision that he was trying to mm. go after. Yeah. Maybe one other thought. Quickly oh, go on ahead, Father Matt. Uh, say something quickly on how to get a, a pastor on board. Uh, first of all, pray for him. Second, invite him out for dinner. Find out what his, his favorite food is. Third, um, and and so um, uh, patience, patience. A lot of times, when you're a new pastor, you come in, you have your own ideas, and it takes you almost a couple of years to kind of hit the until you hit the wall, and like, okay, I it's it, it's not working. What what were you saying again? So um, try to give them, you know, some of these books. Try to find out what who he is influenced by. And uh, go that route, but persistence, 
patience a prayer. Mm, that's great, Father Matthew. Thank you. And Eric, you were about to add. Yeah, add I was just going to add one other thing about the question of resources and, and decisions. And uh, sometimes when, when decisions are put at the table, uh, there isn't a guiding principle, a guiding star, as you had mentioned, Kurt, and that's where vision can come into play. So if you you made sure that, you know, in some way in every agenda item, you you have a reflection or some sort of uh, thought around vision, then when decisions are being brought forward, you've got front of mind the vision um, to help guide that, that um, the decisions that you, you need to make. One very helpful question that we could ask when we're about to make decisions would be, is this a distraction that's disguised as an opportunity? And this is, this is what can help us in that messy middle of all of the activities that we feel are still good in some way, uh, but we're not really sure how it can help us move towards vision. Or we can justify using all kinds of different language and, and ways in which we can get there. So if we take the time to communicate vision well then ask the question, is this a distraction disguised as an opportunity, then the team or the, the deciding body can have more confidence moving mm. forward. Yeah. Awesome. Eric, I have two more burning quick questions. Okay. First is, I, I'm dying to know your thoughts on this. People, there's vision, mission, and sometimes purpose. But let's just stick with vision and mission right now. Sure. In most parishes, we don't do either well. We don't communicate and inspire with vision and mission. Um, like Father Matt talked about, I would say it's been my philosophy I've adopted is like, just just do one and do it well. Yeah. Like I, I've seen very few examples where a parish has, here's our vision, here's our mission, and like actual parishioners that, that it really yeah. lands and moves people. But I'm open to be corrected. Is it good to have a vision and mission and purpose and or just do one well and then add the other if it's going to help you? I mean, what are your thoughts yeah. on vision? Yeah, that's mission, a that, that is an that's a great question. For me, this is what helps. Um, imagine being on a ship in you know in the middle of an ocean, and you have an idea of where you need to go. So you you have an idea that the, at some point past the horizon there is an island that you're aiming to 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 hit, and so mm -hmm. describing that island and describing what like what life could be like once you get to that island is is kind of like that preferred picture of a future. It's a vision. The mission of that ship is to get there. And so in some ways, when you expand that into the life of the parish, like your, your mission and your vision could have similar wordings. It could sound somewhat similar, but this is, that's, that's where the difference is. The mission is to get from A to B and, and A to B as a whole accomplishes the communication of a vision because a vision should be a, a clear mental picture of the future, but it also should demonstrate why it's better there than it is here. So I don't know mm. if that makes sense, but if yeah. you do end up having some some different some nuances yeah. or, or distinctions between the two, you want to be able to paint that preferred picture. But you also want to give to your community, to your parish, a way to get there. So it's yeah. you know, the way could be to transform lives, to invite, to seek and mm. save the lost. And then from there, you can start using more qualitative and descriptive mm. uh, elements to fill out that preferred picture of the future. Yeah, right. I think the, the we always have to ask the question when people do vision work. Sometimes the vision starts actually being mission language, and you have to say, right. "Is this the picture of the future?" So make sure um, yeah. start made with that, and then it's like how we're going to get there. The mission. So uh, go. uh, it's really good. Uh, more questions, but I think we're out of time. But it's uh, really yeah. helpful, Eric and and Father Matt. Thanks for joining us and sharing your wisdom of being a priest who's been on the journey. Right? It's not easy, but you're doing it and you're seeing fruit. And uh, so thank you for you and Susan for all the work you guys are doing at St. Patrick's as well. Yeah, I love this conversation. Eric, Father Matthew, thank you so much for joining us. We want to continue this conversation. And the chat is just, um, mm. there, there's lots of comments in the chat. And, and you know, we have these events and the, the conversation here is really good, but, but we don't have a way to continue uh, this conversation very robustly uh, until today. Because we're going to invite you to uh, head over to Divine Renovations online community over on Facebook. And I think the chat, yeah, the link is there in the chat. You have to request to join. And we want to invite you to join in continuing this conversation. I've put a post in during uh, this call that outlines the, uh, the five um, ways that Eric had um, mentioned. So you can go over there and uh, capture those five questions, but also we'd love to hear from you. What, what stood out for you in this session? What questions do you still have? 
that you want to reference? What resources mm. have you seen? Uh, maybe you want to share what your parish uh, has come up with in regards to uh, the vision, but maybe mm. even more importantly, how have you seen that vision lived out and the picture beginning to come mm. to fruition? So please head over there. You can request to join the group and we'll approve it here uh, right away. We've got folks uh, ready mm. to uh, approve the request. And then just scroll down to the uh, comment on today's session. You can share the link so folks can get the recording of this. And we'd love to continue the discussion there to, to, to chime in and uh, keep mm -hmm. this conversation going. So thanks, everybody, for, for doing that. You can click on that link right now and head over there and uh, chime in. And I'm I'd love to see some examples of, because uh, yeah. I think sometimes we need to see models of of communicating vision effectively. It helps. I know it helps me to see other people do it well, to learn from other people. So we maybe we'll post a few examples of vision homilies and things like that. Well, vision isn't just for homilies, that, but that's one way where you see somebody communicating vision. I know I'm also, I'm going to post a, it is the most powerful three minute talk by Craig Rochelle about the importance of vision. I'm going to post that in there. It is the best three minute summary of why vision is the most important thing to get momentum forward. So uh, we'll share some of that kind of stuff. Love so, it. hey, are we, uh, Eric, are we good? We're going to invite on um, Rebecca to, to to wrap us up and just some important next steps. Yeah, over to you, Rebecca. Okay, everybody, hello. Um, thank you for joining us today. Uh, as we said at the beginning, we're planning on going through the different stages of that pyramid for the next few of our From the Trenches. So we would love for you to join us on October the 10th. Um, why a parish on mission loves leadership summits. And we will be talking all about the role of leadership um, and just some practical things that you can think about as a parish that might help you take the next step in making your parish more missional. So we're super excited about that. Please do register. The link for that is currently in the chat. It will also be in the follow-up email that will come out tomorrow. And as we did say, we are launching a new thing with the Facebook group. You can actually scan this QR code here, or you can register using the link um, that is just slightly further up in the chat there. We really want this to be a place where we can continue some of these conversations and that people can really um, just share some of these really great ideas. We really um, have just been wrestling over the summer with different ways that we can help make these from the trenches interactive, but still giving you lots of practical information and lots of content. And it's just, this is something that we're gonna trial out. Um, so we really hope that you will go over there and engage in that. Um, we'll be as active as possible in approving requests um, and getting you guys involved in that. So we're gonna leave that slide up for a second, just um, in case you wanted to talk to us more about um, vision, um, just know that we have a lot of resources that are available for you. So we'll be sending out some of our leadership guide information tomorrow, but you can also connect with us. You can find your uh, regional relationship guide on our website, and you can also sign up for any of our events. Um, there's a lot of things that we're doing that we really hope are helpful to you as you journey from maintenance to mission, as you take steps out and doing new and creative things with this. Um, so join us on the Facebook group, get in touch with us via email, via the website, um, and we look forward to seeing you again at some future event. Awesome. Well, good. Well, once again, we um, we thank you all so much for making it a priority to to, to be with us. And uh, yeah, just looking forward to the coming year, looking forward to going through the, the pyramids and these key dimensions of renewal with all of you. So thank you for your service to the church. This is... Uh, the renewal of parishes is, uh, I think, one of the great movements in the church in our time, but it's hard. It's messy. Parish culture is hard, but it's beautiful. And so thanks for uh, your work and being a part of uh, this community to, to, to journey forward together. So thanks again. God bless.